All right out there. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our well-being service and equity and inclusion panel. This is one of a series of community panels that we host here at Eastside Prep. Um, many of you may have already joined us for one of our panels, and you can also find recordings of any of our previous uh, community gatherings of this nature on the admissions website. So I just want to direct you to that in case you haven't found those links already. Um, as Ms. Nickel, Katie Nickel, our admissions experience coordinator has noted in the Q&A, we invite you to use that space to send us questions. You may have already come prepared with some things that you wanna ask, uh, or you may have some questions inspired as you hear from some of our panelists this evening. So I'm really excited for you to meet everyone. Um, as folks go around, they're going to introduce themselves and share, uh, you know, kind of what they're doing at EPS, either their grade or their title. Um, and when they joined the Eastside Prep community, they're also going to talk about some of their favorite things at EPS. So, um, you know, clubs and activities that they participate in. And if you have a favorite class this year, um, that's something that folks will share as well. Um, but I will go ahead and um, start by introducing myself if we haven't had a chance to meet already. Cheryl Miller, Director of Enrollment Management at Eastside Prep. I'm in my third year at EPS. And I was saying uh, when we were just chatting with one of our students before we started the call tonight that I love these community panels because it feels like we're back in the LPC, the Levenger Pool Commons, which is this building represented right behind me here, um, just having a conversation over a meal. And that's um, one of the things we love doing the most at Eastside Prep. Um, and really when I think about, uh, you know, especially the themes that we're going to really touch upon this evening through our panelists and through hopefully some of the questions that you ask us about, um, it really comes down to community and wanting to make sure that every member of our community has a sense of belonging in that community, has a sense of their identities being seen and known and valued, um, and having a chance for expression of, uh, of ideas and identities. So um, when we think about how we pertain to the larger community as well, that's another thing that we want to touch upon tonight. So in the spirit of that, I am really excited for uh, for you to get to know the folks that are here. Um, myself and Ms. Nickel will um, will round up the, the pack here. Um, I've already introduced myself, but Katie Nickel will finish this off. Um, we're going to get started with Anhat, who is one of our students. So Anhat, would you mind going ahead and introducing yourself to the panel? Hey, good evening. Um, my name is Anhat Patani. I am a seventh grader here at Eastside Prep. I have been here since the fifth grade. This year I participated in the middle school play, which was a radio play, The Hobbit. In previous years, I've been part of the all school musical, the middle school play, the debate team, uh, numerous sport teams, and some day clubs such as um, the Makerspace Club, Sport Court, and I also got the opportunity to start my own Fungra Dance Club. Fungra Dance Club. Um, what, did you start that as a fifth grader on that? I did. Um, Due to COVID, it didn't really hold up, but I did get the opportunity to start it. Harder, harder to dance as a group um, when you're not getting together as a group, but awesome to hear that that's something that you started as young as fifth grade um, in terms of the club interest. So good for you. Um, we will move on to Harrison. Hey everybody, my name is Harrison. I'm a 10th grader here, so class of 2023 sophomores. Um, I joined in the ninth grade, so this is my second year here. Uh, some things that I've been doing around school, uh, I played for the Frisbee, upper school Frisbee team both years in a row. So last year I was on the JVC team and this year we're doing the whole COVID practice thing. I actually just got back from one of those and hopefully we'll have a spring season this year. And then I was part of the backstage crew for the upper play, upper school play, uh, You Can't Take It With You last year. And I'm hoping to join debate team this year. Awesome, Harrison. Thanks for letting us know what you've been up to, and um, thanks for popping in after a long practice. I'm sure you're you're tired. Did you get some dinner in yet, or later? Uh, I think hopefully I'll be having a meatball sub after this meeting. Excellent. Good. Good plan. Glad to hear it. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ed Castro. Hey, folks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is Ed Castro. I've been here for this is my fourth year at EPS, and I am the music, instrumental music teacher, but uh, currently I'm the interim EICL coordinator and that, that stands for equity, inclusion and compassionate leadership. I kind of work with uh, students and faculty around equity issues and figuring out different ways to make our school a more equitable place. Um, yeah, I think um, 
what's my slogan? I, I forget. I forget how to end my with my slogan. But uh, if since we're since we're in the slogan -y type of situation, I think I'll I'll go with uh, uh, equity plus inclusion equals compassionate leadership, and that's kind of what we do here at EPS. Mm, love love that. Appreciate that. Um, and if you are not seeing Dr. Castro in class uh, or at a meeting, he's probably hanging out with his family or playing the trumpet. True story? Yeah, he's got it right there. Uh, Dr. Olson. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Elena Olson, and um, I teach English in the upper school, and I'm also one of seven college counselors. I hope I have that number right. Um, it's a large team of us, um, which is a really strong way actually in the upper school that that I think we um, support students well being. They, um, they have a, a really great supportive college counseling process um, as part of their experience. Um, in addition to teaching English and um, diving into all things literary and writing with students uh, and college. Um, I'm also the faculty sponsor for the Girls Empowerment Club, and um, that is one of my favorite um, roles. Actually, I started doing that last year, um, and it's a lot of fun. And I've, I've been working, I get to work with Ed sometimes in that too, which is also fun. Yay! <clears throat> Well, thanks, Dr. Olson. Ms. Andrus. Hello, everybody. My name is Jamie Andrus, and I am the Learning Support Coordinator at Eastside Prep. This is my fourth year. Um, I also teach uh, Guided Study Hall along with um, three other learning support specialists who are a part of our learning support team. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work with um, Ed and Elena as part of our equity and inclusion and compassionate leadership group this year. And um, I think my favorite thing is that I was recruited by a group of seventh graders to be the faculty sponsor of the anime club, um, which I know nothing about, but I have been learning a lot. So they're eager to teach me and share all of their knowledge with me. That is, do you have like a favorite uh, either uh, artist or character so far during your time getting to know anime? Um, no, I don't. I mostly just um, try to keep up with their conversation, but they they are very passionate and have a lot of incredible knowledge. So it's been a great experience. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Mr. Hagen. Hello, everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us this evening. My name is Paul Hagen. I'm the director of student well-being and I'm in my 12th year here at Eastside Prep, so you know I like it quite a bit to stick around. Uh, and I, my favorite part has always been working with um, just the different folks that I get to work with on a daily basis. So certainly our students, but also my wonderful colleagues, many of whom are on this call, and parents and guardians. Um, so uh, really lucky to, to, to be here. Um, when we think about well-being here, for me, I'm thinking about social, emotional, and physical well-being. So I get to work with some wonderful colleagues in the uh, counseling office, as well as Ed, who you heard from for EICL coordination, uh, as well as our school nurse. Uh, and then we also are looking at um, student activities and clubs. And so I, I work with our activities and club coordinator to make sure that our kids are feeling really well connected. Sweet. Thanks, Mr. Hagen. We, we like you too. So we're glad to have kept you around for all these 12 years. Uh, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Glad, glad, glad that they didn't kick you out yet, right? <laughs> good, to, good to get that confirmation every once in a while, you know? Oh, good, good. Uh, Mr. Delaney. Good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Delaney. I'm the Director of Academic Design and Integration. Um, I facilitate conversations about the development of our academic program. Uh, 15 years ago, I got to start working with Dr. Olson, um, building our American Studies program. Um, and at that time, we were thinking about, OK, how do we represent as many voices as possible in our curriculum? Uh, more recently this year, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Castro in looking at our curriculum um, and the different voices um, and perspectives that are represented in it. 
And uh, for me to really think about, it's incredibly rewarding to think about um, teaching a class like undercover economics or urban planning um, and thinking about uh, people's lived experiences and how they might be improved. Mm, appreciate all that. And yeah, I think the effort from the EICL group, the Equity, Inclusion, and Compassionate Leadership group to be thinking about, um, you know, where do students have windows and mirrors in the curriculum, you know, to, to seeing their own experiences and to having insights into the experiences of others is a big part of the work that our faculty do to integrate all of these themes. So, um, and, you know, and help students to be to be seen. So thanks, Mr. Delaney, for being here and very happy to turn it over to the, the woman behind the curtain, my colleague, Katie Nichol. How are you this evening, Katie? Uh, I'm doing really well. Uh, my name is Katie Nichol and I'm the admissions experience coordinator here at Eastside Prep. Uh, this is admission season number five for me, which sounds wild to say. Um, tonight I am serving as mission control um, for this event. And in fact, I serve as mission control for every event that we are doing this season as the experience <laughs> coordinator. Um, so, you know, if there's a delay on switching the screen, it's not on the speaker, it's on me. Um, in addition to working in the admissions department, I am also a middle school robotics coach. Um, this year, middle school robotics is being done through Minecraft EDU, um, which much like Jamie and the anime club, I know nothing about Minecraft, but the students are teaching me a ton. Um, I have also served as an 11th grade advisor and I have supported the middle school leadership lab in the past as well. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all again so much for taking part in this evening's event. And I want to kick it off with a question really with regards to um, well-being as a general principle. When we uh, transition to having a an office of well-being, uh, the idea of well-being really centering in our program and, and in everything that we do at Eastside Prep, um, you know, we really wanted to be very intentional about being sure that there was an opportunity for students to uh, really know that we're thinking about the balance of things. We're thinking about how um, the social, the emotional, the academic, all these things are intertwined. Um, and so I'm wondering for each of you um, within your life as a member of the EPS community, what are some things that EPS helps you do in order to keep things in a balance or you know if, if the construct of balance doesn't work for you um you know maybe keep things in the right kind of juggle <laughs> that um that is serving you at, at when you need it to so what would be some things that come to mind in terms of just that aspect of you know in what ways the eps community or certain members of it or certain programs within it are helping you to keep things balanced in your life Uh, Ms. Miller, I know something for myself that helps a lot. Um, in fact, just yesterday as a admin team, we got to participate in a yoga session, um, mm -hmm. which is awesome that, you know, we do these things for our students, but we're also doing them for our faculty and staff to help us maintain balance as well. And just remember that every so often we need to get up from our computer, especially right now as we're in this remote learning space. So I appreciate that we got to sit through that yoga session yesterday and then we have our own um, professional development that also walks us through our emotional well-being as well. Um, I can't speak to the student experience because I'm not a student at Eastside Prep, but as an admin um, staff member, I definitely appreciate those resources. Mm, yes, I agree. Desk yoga was pretty awesome yesterday with Vandana. <laughs> Well, I guess as a student at EPS, um, I think, yeah, I guess it's really, I've really appreciated how the school has actually really stuck with us throughout this whole thing, because I have a lot of friends at Bellevue High School, uh, most of the Bellevue School Districts, and they basically talked to me about how Bellevue School District was like, okay, here's our plan for remote learning. We give you guys work, you do work, you turn in work. Okay, good. And I feel like this school with uh, the daily emails coming out from Dr. Macaluso and the uh, I remember I participated in the recreate a uh, painting from the Seattle Art Museum challenge. I may not have really wanted to originally, but my mom was like, hey Harrison, hey Harrison, hey Harrison, you should do this. And eventually we did and it was a lot of fun. It was pretty interesting to see the other people who had done it. And I really, I really appreciate how the school has stuck with us throughout this. And um, I went to one of the in-person events, I think the one on the 26th. That was great to get to see some of my friends. So yeah, I guess I really appreciate how they've stuck with us and made sure that we are keeping that balance. Mm, that's really good to hear, Harrison. Can you talk about the in-person event that you attended and what, what that was like, what kinds of things you did? 
Oh yeah, totally. So um, we had a smaller group. It was just five people from the 10th grade. Um, the nice thing about having these kind of smaller, but also not that small classes, you know everybody, but there's always room to get to know people more. So uh, we basically, we honestly, I had a uh, Profe Botero, who I'm lucky enough to have my, as my Spanish teacher. Uh, she was our teacher person. So we basically, we sat around and we talked for a while. We covered some interesting topics talking about, we talked about, uh, I think the Venezuelan economic crisis a little bit. And then we dodged over into more fun topics like Seahawks football. And yeah, so it was just a really nice time to get to uh, get to see everybody. And of course it was totally socially distanced. We did all the check-ins and the temperature checks before. Mm -hmm. So you felt safe participating, and it sounds like you had a chance to connect with classmates on various topics. Quite, quite the variety there: the, <laughs> the Venezuelan economic situation and the, the Seattle Seahawks. I, you know, I wonder what the conversational pivot was there. If you remember it, feel free to share it. If not, no worries. Who else wants to talk about kind of what what things at EPS help keep uh, keep them in balance? Ms. Miller, can... I'd like. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Olson. Okay. Um, I just uh, Harrison's um, uh, Harrison talking about the the gathering and the, the conversation um, made me reflect on one kind of continual part of life at EPS that I don't really ever think about because it's it's just part of life that I it does help keep me balanced um, is conversation and collaboration. I think, um, you know, one aspect of our community as a faculty, as, as an adult community um, and staff community that also is part of the student community um, is that we love <laughs> um, working with each other, talking with each other, bouncing ideas off each other, talking through ideas, brainstorming. Um, and I think there's some lip service that's paid to that and 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 you know collaborative work is something that is you know sort of almost a cliche i think in a lot of um workplaces and and certainly schools but um we have been that from the beginning i, I think i forgot to say earlier that this is my 15th year at Eastside prep um and you know when i started there were i don't know 20 some faculty and i think 60 some students um, and it's been pretty remarkable that today, um, you know, at multiple um, multiples of both of those numbers, we still have this very cohesive, collaborative, conversational culture. And that keeps me balanced because, you know, if I'm stressed about a problem um, or I am, you know, wrestling with, um, with a lesson plan or, or just, you know, suddenly realize like, actually, I don't think I want to do that, that same thing that I did last year, you know, with, you know, talking about this chapter in, in this book that I'm teaching. Um, I can go talk to a colleague about it and that conversation. And I know that that conversation will be welcome, um, which is, which is really great. And that isn't the case at, um, at other schools necessarily um, in the way that it's embedded in our culture here. And I, I really appreciate that. And, and again, like even in this remote environment, um, we have we've kept that alive in a lot of ways, which I appreciate even more now. Ms. Miller, I think I'll echo uh, a lot of what Dr. Olson just referenced. When we are in person um, and I come to lunch, um, it's exciting at EPS to see where the open seat is. Like, who you're going to get to talk to, right? It's not a pattern thing where you're sitting with the same people every day. It's an opportunity to connect with a variety of people. Um, so community is so important, and I think even more important now as folks are feeling isolated in current circumstances. So whether it's being in my class and connecting with the 17 I have on the screen, or in a meeting that um, that Dr. Castro is leading in the morning, or doing a meeting with Ms. Andrus and thinking about how we're thinking about um, learning and the academic program at the same time. Those are community opportunities for me, which is great for my, my balance. And I guess I would re refer to it as harmony. And then I'd say my best evidence is I have a sixth grader in the EPS program. 
Um, and I don't think everybody gets to say right now um, in this situation um, that they have kiddos who are thriving. Um, but sometimes I can't tell, like from the, the laughing that's going on as my son um, is on the screen, whether or not he's in class or in between classes mm -hmm. um, and connecting with peers. So um, seeing that community exist for him, even at distance, is, is a really good um, representation of our culture at EPS. That's great to hear. Yeah, I think I want to jump in a little bit with uh, with this question because oftentimes there, there are conversations that happen at EPS, which then end up being conversations that happen at home in, in, a, in a fantastic way. So for example, the Girls Empowerment Club uh, did a discussion on uh, the importance and the impact of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and that conversation translated to a, a dinnertime conversation with my 10-year-old daughter, right? And so we got to talk a little bit about what what uh, I got to talk with my daughter about in, in a real meaningful way. It was like, Here, here's what we're discussing at my school. Uh, and she, re you know, she, she appreciated, my wife appreciated, it was a great conversation and th those kinds, th the things that happen in clubs often end up in in my home with uh, conversations with my kid and then and then out in the community as well. That's so great. those conversations are crucial. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anhad, is there anything you want to share from the student experience in terms of your personal balance between different aspects of life at EPS? Sure, I have to agree with everyone that um, the community is a really big part of EPS, and I'm lucky to be a part of a community that's so welcoming. For me, teachers and advisors keep me balanced. I remember coming into fifth grade, I was just so like greedy to do everything, every opportunity I saw. Um, but they didn't tell me, no, oh, you can't do three maximum. They told me, okay, well, you know, we'll figure out how we can help you. Um, like manage academics and your personal interests. So I think EPS does a really good job of balancing the two um, things. And um, like I said, I'm fortunate to be a part of this community. Great, thank you for that, Anhat. So um, I want to ask you all another question, which is really around um, the engagement that we have as a community. And I'm wondering if each of you would be able to share something. This could be an education beyond the classroom experience, maybe a unit that you did in a particular class or something that you were endeavoring you know, to explore more as part of a, a club or activity, um, but just something that really strikes you as um, a place where you had to do some meaningful self-reflection. Um, I think one of the things that we know is really key to our work in equity, inclusion, and compassionate leadership is understanding our own identities and understanding our own biases. Um, so I'm wondering if you would have anything to share in terms of you know, reflection on a lesson or reflection on an activity or some sort of um, education that you're doing off campus um, outside of the EPS community directly um, that really had some impact on you and, and maybe caused you to reflect on something inside of yourself or made you have to you know, examine something um, maybe a little bit deeper. So um, anything that comes to mind with respect to some of those experiences that you might have had? Um, well, Cheryl, I can share that this summer, Dr. Castro and I had the opportunity to participate in the um, Diversity Leadership Institute that is put on by the National Association of Independent Schools that um, EPS um, sent us to, which was an incredible opportunity. And I think what's been even more exciting is how eager all of our colleagues have been to hear about what we learned and what resources we have to share with them. Uh, so that, that's been a huge impact and having that um, opportunity provided was, um, was really incredible. I also think this is only sort of tangentially related to what you were um, asking, but one thing I did wanna comment on is you know, the, the sort of long term relationships that we get to have with our students. And, um, you know, I, for example, 
just heard from a, um, a former student who sent me an email yesterday morning letting me know how college is going for her. Um, and so that that type of connection um, has been really critical to um, balance, but also just you know really enjoying um, the community and the all the people, including all of the students that we get to work with. I appreciate you sharing that. That's it's great to hear that she's doing well. I'll jump in on that question because I think um, since uh, since I teach music, I get the opportunity to kind of make uh, equity a thing in my classroom. And recently I, I received an email from a former student who uh, was was at the school when we did a unit on Stevie Wonder and we we examined Stevie Wonder as not the musical genius that that he is, but more as the more as a civil rights actor activist and we we used him as a, an example of someone who could tell story and use the arts to advance uh progressive ideas and and uh and and unity uh she wrote this email uh about a presentation she did and basically she outlined that basically we went through and she went through and and went exactly as we did in our class uh pointing uh pointing out different aspects of Stephen wonder's life pointing out different songs making sure the students uh that she was presenting to were paying attention to the lyrics not just the dope beats and the fire the fire tracks because Stephen wonder was a genius that way yes but you know, really, really listening to the message. And, uh, I, you know, I, it, I was taken aback because it'd been a while since we'd done that. Uh, we did that, we did that show, I think, yeah, last school year. So to, to have have the student come and come back and reach back and say, hey, I did this thing that, that we did in school was kind of really meaningful and, and that it tied directly to the equity issue, the equity messaging that we're getting around, the really listening and really paying attention, not just to like awesome melodies, because Stevie Wonder is known for that, but really like the messaging behind the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And that's one of a handful of uh, deeper dives that you've done into particular American musicians. Is that correct, Dr. Castro? Yeah, we um, we've taken a we've taken a deep dive into Jimi Hendrix, a deep dive into um, uh, well, early jazz on hot was our drummer for for most of the, the beginning early jazz stuff. Um, that unit, uh, we've taken a deep dive into Duke Ellington, Miles Davis. Um, and the one thing right now we're looking at uh, taking a deep dive really into Thelonious Monk and Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. And the the way that unit has has shaped, um, it started off as just really understanding the music. And then we, we've kind of gone into this place where we're really looking at kind of the mental health mm. of these particular artists mm -hmm. and, and, and the way they were coping with it and how it affected their family and how it affected their art. It was, it's, been, it, it's been a really interesting turn to talk about those issues and those, the, those aspects with very prominent artists and very prominent creators. Mm. So. So we it, and oftentimes and that that was not part of my lesson plan. That's just where the students wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at equity really from from that perspective as well. That that aspect of well being. Mm -hmm. That's great, and it's so important. Um, I think we know that a lot of. Uh, our fellow citizens and our, our school community, our broader community, you know, this is a challenging situation that we're in right now, um, being isolated from one another in so many ways. So being able to, um, you know, find those examples within folks that we might be talking about for other reasons, but the students, you know, they want to take it there. And so you go there um, as an instructor. I think that's really powerful. Other examples of experiences that folks want to share? I think as, as Dr. Castro was talking, I was thinking um, a lot about what we're working on in my undercover economics class right now. Um, the students are working on a, a personal budget project, um, but they look at it from through three different lenses. Um, so they have they're able to pick their own profession um, and figure out how like what that's going to mean, what kind of education they may, might might have and what that's going to cost um, and other life expenses. Um, 
They also, they've got a budget column that's right next to that, that's looking at the median average, the median income in Seattle. And then they've got another uh, column next to that, that is um, folks are at the poverty line in the United States. And so um, looking, you know, through three different lenses to think about budget, to think about the distribu distribution of wealth in the United States, um, to broaden our perspective beyond what's right in front of us right now, um, and to think about people who are in different, you know, lived situations, um, and how that and how that might play out for folks, right? So, um, very much like using our imagination um, to enter enter a compassionate space. Mm. And powerful to be able to tie that to local community. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, for, for oh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, go I ahead, was, Mr. Hagan, and then Ms. and Dr. Olson. Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking, actually, in a way, it, it sort of marries the last two questions um, about sort of how do we maintain balance or how does the community give back, as well as this idea of experience and growth. And, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about the work that I'm doing is I get to work with some very uh, talented people, and all of them are uh, have a singular focus on improvement and learning more. And so, you know, I get to, you know, so for example, working with our counselors, I met with our counselors today, and they are pushing our uh, social emotional learning program through our advisory. Um, and they've done some incredible work there. I think we do some really great work there, but they're always pushing to say, what's the best practice? How can we reach, reach kids? What lessons do we need to cover? Um, thinking about themes by grade level and some of those things. And then they're going out to get the professional help they need um, to address those issues or to, to uh, keep up to date on their own understanding of how best to serve our community. That's true of, of Ed, who's on this call with, you know, he's Ed's in an interim position right now as EICL coordinator and is doing an incredible job, not only of guiding that program, but of continuing to educate himself and those around him and doing, you know, one of the things that that is a great highlight for me is being a part of the adult EICL group, which is a which is a working group. We're a group of faculty and administrators and staff who meet um, uh, every three weeks or so in the morning to to move our EICL program uh, forward. Yes, but also to improve our own understanding and to sort of do the reflective piece that is so important because, you know, all of us come from different backgrounds. All of us have different opinions and we're trying to uh, pull together with some some shared uh, experience and understanding. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that keeps me going day in and day out, I mean, it's already been mentioned by many on this on this call, but the community, the connection that we have with with colleagues, with students, with parents, um, I would add to that the laughter. We laugh a lot. I was trying to think of today. Today, my, my day started at 730 with our fifth grade advising team. Uh, and I was trying to count, like, how many times was I laughing today? And <laughs> I lost count. I mean, by lunchtime, I'd already been laughing in half a dozen meetings, um, you know, with all different sorts of uh, folks in our community, you know, including my own advisory group in with, with a bunch of fifth graders. And we laugh a lot. Um, and and going right on through the end of the day. And so that keeps me going as well. But then the the uh, intentionality about improving ourselves and and bringing in more information and more research and not just resting on on our successes, because I think we have many, but finding ways to ever improve our program and our service to students. And I think that to me is what keeps the job exciting and, and keeps the place um, fresh and dynamic um, day in and day out. That's great. Constant improvement, constant laughter, all good. <laughs> Dr. Olson, what were you going to share? Yeah, actually, this is um, kind of building on what um, what Paul said. I think, you know, as a teacher, I'm I really am appreciative of the ways in which I have been supported in in my own growth and learning and self-reflection. I think, I mean, I think all teachers are are also learners. I mean, we're we're teachers in a way because we we love learning and we don't really stop learning. And um and I think, you know, I there's so many ways I could talk about this. Um from, you know, as um Mr. Delaney mentioned earlier when I started teaching here, um 
the uh, upper school only went through 10th grade. There was a ninth grade and a 10th grade. Um, we didn't, we hadn't yet graduated a class. There was no 11th grade or 12th grade. Um, and Mr. Delaney and I developed um, the American Studies program, the, the literature and the, the history um, side of our 11th grade year studying um, history and literature. And um, in that, I was, you know, I, I was reflecting on, as Mr. Delaney said, how do we include as many voices in this <clears throat> as we can, voices that are often excluded from traditional um, American literature and history um, curriculum. Um, and that has been sort of my guiding principle as a teacher and the school has been so supportive of that. Teachers have um, a lot of support and autonomy in, um, in delving and develop delving into and developing curriculum that um, that is inclusive and that is meaningful for um, for hopefully all students um, and uh, and I appreciate that as a teacher and I appreciate that as a learner because it continually pushes me to um, you know to be reading new literature and to be to be thinking about um, all those those voices to include. We, we recently redesigned all of the ninth grade um, humanities courses, the history and literature courses. And one of my goals in that, which we achieved was, um, was gender equity with our, with our authors and on the literature side. So making sure that um, at least half of the texts that ninth graders read are authored by women. Um, and then also aiming for as um, broad of a, you know, a diverse of a, um, a range um, in terms of around the world and race and um, geographies and um, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. So that's been, that's just been as a teacher, um, you know, I'm, whenever I want to pursue something, again, I can have a conversation um, with Mr. Delaney as academic dean or with the appropriate person. I just actually last weekend, just this past weekend, attended the Learning and Brain Conference um and you know was that that isn't directly related to my field of literature but um but it supports um other training that i've done and it's it's just good professional development to be learning about the latest um, neuroscience research um in terms of learning so mm, that's great how was how was attending it as a virtual conference? <laughs> you attended before in person, or was this your first it time? It was attending? virtual. It was virtual um, Saturday and Sunday, and it was on East Coast time. So I got up um, at about five thirty, five forty-five a.m. this weekend, both days, <laughs> and <laughs> logged on to my computer by six thirty a.m. So um, that part of it was. You know, it was it was good. I, I started my my weekend days early. Um, it was it was actually it was great. Obviously not as great as being able to be somewhere in person, but I was grateful to be able to do it. Um, That's yeah, awesome. Learned a lot. And I I can add on to what Elena was saying. In my role, I get to have a lot of experience with all of the curriculum across the grades and across disciplines. And it's been really fun to see how much it's evolved since I started at EPS um, and the changes and improvements that teachers are constantly looking to make in order to bring in more representation um, and increase the diversity of the offerings. Um, but also I think just um, like Elena said, we're always learning. We're always changing what we want to do and try and improving our classes as much as possible. Uh, so, and as a lifelong learner as well, I have really enjoyed it because I have been exposed to some fabulous literature and um, historical resources that I wouldn't have gotten an opportunity to see otherwise. So it's been really fun uh, from a teaching perspective also to get to experience all of that new material that's coming in all the time. Mm. Yeah. Ms. Miller, I would I would love to um, students. This is what I try to do in my classes. So Harrison Hanhat, I'm letting you know a question is coming your way. So we have we have wait time built in here. OK, um, <laughs> when I'm thinking about how we approach equity, inclusion, diversity, 
Um, we do it in a number of different ways. And as uh, Ms. Andrus was talking, I'm thinking about like how we work to recognize students as individual learners, right? Coming to the curricula we're talking about um, as who they are and, and working to have them feel comfortable um, and, and, um, and seen um, as they come into the classroom. So Anhat Harrison, I'm curious as you think about EPS and yourself as an individual learner, can you maybe find an example where um, you've seen that or both seen and felt that, right? That you're invited in as you yourself um, to explore a curriculum or a topic uh, or something that's important to you? And I'm happy to rephrase if you want me to. Um, I'm not just going to directly answer the question, um, but in history, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, we're learning about not just like one side of the story, um, like the more um, popular side or like the more biased side of the story, but learning about both sides of the story. Um, and I'm learning about people who I haven't learned of before. And some of these people are have similar identities to me. Um, that's a topic we're learning about in history and, and lit and lit this year. Um, our our theme is identity. So I'm getting a lot of time to reflect on my own identity and learn about other identities that are similar to mine. And that's an environment that is, that is inviting to me. Um, I feel like I can share my identity with everyone else in the class um, because it's such an open area just to discuss and have new ideas um, to talk about. Well, for me, I actually have an interesting story related to identity too. I had uh, Dr. Olson for my fall tri lit class last year, and it was boundaries lit. So we were talking about in social studies, more physical boundaries like state lines and in uh, uh, lit more about like identity type boundaries. And uh, the first module, first half of the trimester, we talked about uh, and we read Anne Frank and we discussed that aspect of identity. And I thought that was interesting, but I did know a decent amount of World War II history because that was something we'd done in previous years. However, uh, the other half of the unit, we read a book called Zenzele Tales for My Daughter. And I thought that was actually really interesting. It was about the liberation of Africa from the British colonies, British colonial times. And I knew really nothing about that. So I thought that was super interesting. And then another thing that I did from last year, I took both graphic design courses and I had literally no computer experience. I was only known as the tech kid in my family because neither of my parents were tech people. Um, <laughs> but that course was really interesting for me. I took both of them with Mr. Hutch, who unfortunately left because I think the four hour commute each way was a little much for him. <laughs> but I thought both of those courses were super interesting and I'm honestly still using the things I learned from there in like designing projects and different logos today. Well, it's great to hear that you've been able to apply a lot of that knowledge and yeah Hutch uh, I, I used to commute with Hutch and uh, I, I think a side effect of EPS remote is that I'm not commuting right now and and I think Hutch is a little sad that he left right as his commute was coming to a temporary end um, but he's having a good time down in Dallas at his new school so I appreciate you mentioning that experience though um, so I just want to take a, a brief pause and invite folks if you have a question that is percolated based on some of the things that we've already been discussing uh, please go ahead and throw that in the Q&A area we will be delighted to entertain any and all questions that you have. Um, the panelists, they get a general sense ahead of time of some of the things that I might ask them, um, but we really freestyle. And part of what I think is refreshing about these panels is that we are um, going to be candid in, in the moment with you about our responses. So um, no canned answers here at Eastside Prep, um, and we really want to receive those questions from you. So please go ahead and add things in the chat as you think of them. Um, I had a couple of threads that I wanted to pull on from some things that we already touched upon. Um, and one is around how we gauge um, whether students are experiencing well-being. And so um, maybe this is a Paul Hagen question specifically, but I'm sure others will have some input to it as well. Um, what are some ways that we are, as a community, gauging um, whether we're moving the needle on um, students having enhanced well-being as part of the ESET prep community? 
How do we know that? How are we measuring that? Um, and what are some some things that we're you know endeavoring to do to um, to make progress in particular areas? So is that a is that a question that starts with you, Paul? I can I can certainly start with it absolutely, um, and then others are welcome to chime in. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think when we think about the concept of well-being and whether or not students are experiencing well-being, um, it starts with relationship. And so, you know, I think of, of I mean, you've heard already some examples of, of the relationships that students and, and uh, faculty have at school, whether it's in a class, working on a project together, or certainly as we're talking about our advisory program, which for those of you who don't know, our advisory is a grade, le grade specific, uh, grade level specific uh, group of students, typically about 12 for that advisory group with one advisor for the entire year. Uh, and the programming there is everything from social emotional learning um, to community building and sort of fun and games to some academic um, advising pieces as well. So, you know, we do a lot in, in, in advisory itself to build those relationships and to build the connection not only between student and advisor, but between parent or guardian and advisor as well. So we have the open lines of communication between school and, and family and home life. Um, and that gives us a good read on sort of how students are doing, what the stress levels might be. Um, are students able to engage with their classes effectively? Um, how are they feeling? Um, and then certainly we have our counseling office, which I mentioned we have three counselors, uh, really excellent counselors who do a lot of work, both with groups of students um, as they're doing some training and program pieces there, as well as working with students one on one who might need a little additional support. Um, in terms of how do we measure though beyond just sort of you know getting the feeling based on based on the relationships that we build, um, we have done some targeted uh, surveying of students and uh, and some polls of students uh, as well. So we uh, uh, did uh, some work last year. Um, to survey our, our students to understand how they're feeling about a variety of different things. It was an anonymous uh, survey. Uh, we, uh, we worked with an outside organization to ensure that those survey questions were accurate and so that we'd have some real uh, meaningful and measurable data next to other schools um, as well. And you know that helped us understand where our students were a snapshot in time which then helped us think about where we need to go as a school, you know, with with everything. You know, we know that uh, for our best intention, we're not always getting everything right. And so, you know, for example, in that survey, one of the things that we found is while many of our students, the majority of our students feel really well connected and do feel a sense of community site prep, not every student felt that way. And so we were able to then take that information that we got really a year ago, it was the first week in November last year, um, and apply it to some programs going forward to ensure that we are bringing students into the fold, whether it's um, through the equity and inclusion lens or whether it's just from the community side of how do we build fun and excitement um, and, and social experiences into the day to day life that will attract students to, to come in. Um, and then, you know, we we do additional. We've just done some some surveys of students within their classes themselves to think about things like um, uh, how they're doing in classes. Are they getting the content? What their homework load looks like in in classes, which has I think a huge impact on well-being. Um, and then we've done some general surveys this year specific to remote learning and how we're doing there, and and are we able to um, connect well with kids, even though the kids are taking classes at, in their homes. Um, so we're trying to take a pretty holistic view of, of all of that. And I'm not sure if I'm missing things that others can jump in on. Harrison, do you remember taking that survey a year ago by any chance? Or was that in the blur of ninth grade for you? Um, I think I do. Which one was it? It was uh, the one, not the strengths one. It was the one that uh, was about like, actually, I'm not totally sure I remember. Yeah, it, was through, it was through an organization called um, Authentic Connections. And it was sort of a lengthy one. We did it in advisory and it took a full, pretty much a full advisory time, uh, but it covered all sorts of, uh, you know, issues. How are you feeling about school? How are you feeling about your peers? Um, so it, it covered a, a wide I think I do actually of... remember that. I, yeah, 
Well, I think we took one similar to that in middle school too. I was mm -hmm. at Chinook Middle School. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if that tells you anything, it's that we do survey and check in a lot. If Harrison <laughs> can't remember this one specific survey, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, yes, and and I think that, that I mean, a survey is an opportunity for us to temperature check and see how things are going, and it's an also an opportunity for reflection. Um, this year in the um, in the academic program, we've also moved to be surveying more frequently, and we have a thing called the Student Experience Survey. Um, which we, we've shortened and we're doing more frequently now with students at distance to understand how their class experience is going. Um, and that's not just about, um, it's certainly about what are you learning, right? And what are your favorite assignments? But like, are you are you feeling connected, right? Are you feeling engaged, right? That's a really good um, a metric for us to look at um, to identify how we're doing in this new circumstance. Um, and I, I have to say, I was very pleased watching um, some of that information come back specifically for my class, right? To get uh, really great substantive feedback from students um, and also for them to be able to let them know that what I was working on with them was resonating, right? Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, Mr. Delaney. Well, speaking of, you know, what is what is resonating and what is uh, what is happening now? Um, got a great question in the chat, which is due to the current political climate in the Seattle area, what is an example of something you did well or changed to be better? And what did that look like? So um, in response to, you know, various things that uh, have been part of our, our, certainly our local climate, also connected to our, um, you know, regional and, and national climate um, in terms of, you know, different political and social movements. Um, what are some, what are some things that come to mind from our panelists in terms of ways that the EPS community has responded and, um, you know, and what did that look like? What, what did we change or um, how did we shift things? The first thing that comes to mind for me is the middle school assembly um, that we did just the other week, um, really changing the focus um, from sort of the current political climate to what a civic engagement look like and how to participate and engage with your community. And um, we had an upper school student come in and present to us about some of the work that he's been doing, um, getting involved with local city council. Um, and so I, you know, we so often think of um, politics in, in sort of the, the broader sense, but people don't often know or often don't know how to get involved in sort of a local level and just really be a part of their um, local community. And that's something that I think a lot of students want to know, you know, what they can do, especially um, they're, if they're not of voting age, how can they help to make their community the kind of place that they want it to be? And so I love that that was the way that that was framed um, for them and um, that, you know, that it was, um really fit in well with our vision of helping students to create a better world um, and so i loved i loved that tie-in for them and you could see that they were really engaged and they had a lot of questions it was wonderful yeah super great presentation and i really just i i love seeing that connection between what ethan had done for purposes of an eps independent study a project he had taken two projects he had undertaken as an eps upper schooler bringing that content to our middle schoolers and hopefully inspiring some of them to be not only thinking about yeah what is that local political engagement but what's something that i care enough about in this respect that i want to do an independent study about it someday it's super cool i'll just jump on on this as well i mean i thought um you know one of one of the things as i was thinking about the political climate both locally and then nationally um as we've just just completed this election um, for many of our students, there is some excitement uh, around various parts of a, of a political um, campaign or political movement. For many of our students, there's some fear associated with, with some of that. And so, you know, especially for our young students, I think we did a nice job of providing some understanding 
to dispel some of the fear that comes from, you know, I'm seeing all this stuff on TV. I don't know really how to make sense of it all. So we're going to provide just some information on how the process works. And so as, as Jamie mentioned, just uh, the work that we're doing with middle schoolers um, in, in assemblies and having an upper school student who they look up to, uh, who's done some really great research on this to present to them um, was a really meaningful piece. But we also did some work with all of our students, five through 12, on coping with emotions. And it wasn't directly related to the election. We didn't say this is this is a, an advisory lesson just on the election. Right. Although it was really talking about uncertainty and how do you deal with some uncertainty and when you're facing difficult emotions one way or the other, how do you manage that? What are some tactics you can use? And this was designed and, and put together by our counselors who worked with our grade level coordinators and our advisors to deliver this, this um, content for all of our students. And I will just say, I, again, I'm a fifth grade advisor and I had a fifth grade student who, um, my, my advisee who told me um, shortly before the election, um, we were doing a check-in and she said, I'm really scared. And I, it kind of took me back because we weren't talking about the election at all. It was just a check-in. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, my folks really like to watch the news. And every time they turn it on, it just frightens me. And she was nervous about COVID and she was nervous about the election and the different things that she was hearing on the news. And after we did the advisory session on, on coping, she me, uh, you know, we had another check in and she said that helped so much for me to both understand sort of my own emotions around these things that I'm seeing, but give me an outlet so that I can manage it and cope with it going forward. And so, you know, one example, um, but I think it's pretty uh, representative of, of how we're able to reach to, to students. The one other thing I will say, one, one thing we did is beyond our um, sort of standard programming around all of this. We've also added in some lunch groups um, to discuss things like the election or, or things happening in the community or world around them. Um, and some of those are really focused on some real deep content. Our upper school head, Dr. Stegman, did a great uh, group last week on dialogue and debate and how do you, you know, how do you have differences of opinion and, and share those differences of opinion in a political um, uh, climate that's pretty polarized. Um, but we did some that were, you know, a little more funny uh, or a little more fun. So I, I ran one last week on uh, political parody and why we laugh at our leaders. And it, and it really went from all the way back to King George when we were in colonial times and, and the, some of the political cartoons that were uh, written there and all the way to today. And then we have moments of uh, mindfulness and de-stress uh, to just help students cope with with some of the feelings they might have around uh, around the political climate today. I appreciate that, Mr. Higgin. And uh, we got a clarification for the question um, that I wanted to add in. And I'm hoping um, that Dr. Castro, you might be able to speak to this from the interim EICL coordinator role that you are in right now. Um, the clarification is what has the school done in terms of policy or action on the part of the administration. So not issues outside of the school, but you know, things about the school itself. So um, so you know, really what what sorts of things have we done, you know, in 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 uh, a shaping of kind of what, what happens internally at EPS um, that might be a reflection of kind of what's happening in the outside world. Well some of some of what we what we've looked at is uh, as been mentioned before, we we're really looking at cultural competency. Uh, and what that means. Um, we had a great, uh, speaking of assemblies, we had a great talk by one of our, one of our community members, one of our parents came in and, and it, as part of an assembly to just talk about difficult things. Uh, how do you deal with, how do you deal with differences and how do you address those differences? I thought that was a wonderful discussion, uh, especially in today's climate where we've got big differences and not necessarily under not necessarily um, underscoring that because we have different ideas we we can't communicate but more we're all evolving and we're all we all need to make sure we're we're communicating uh, in a clear way about the things that the things that we want to get across so you know in that particular discussion what uh what struck me was that it did matter who was going to be in office that this work was going to continue right so this particular person uh works in education uh at one point she worked at, at microsoft and saw and noticed that 
there were things that she could have done differently uh, to help out the community. And it wouldn't matter who was in office at the time. And and it doesn't matter now that this work has has got to keep keep moving. So I think that's kind of the the premise. Like, how does how does this internal struggle for equity inform how you approach what you what you do in your in your day to day life? So this person chose a career change and moved from the tech world and used the tech tech uh, knowledge to address some uh, fundamental changes in uh, education and equity in education. A uh, couple of weeks back, we literally, we had, a, 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 I think, a professor from Albany, one of uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Stegman's friends came in and gave a great talk about, you know, what, you know, the history of, and kind of in prepping us for, for this moment, the history of contested elections. and. It was, it was fascinating to revisit that. Um, from our end, we are doing the EICL, um, the EICL office itself, we're doing a lot of really intricate focused uh, work on understanding identity and where we can shine a light on those and celebrate identity at school through potentially looking at uh, affinity groups. Uh, we're also re researching what cultural competency is, and we've got another focus group on that. So we've got a couple of things going on in those in those two areas to really help us kind of define and help students figure out what those things are, and then how we're going to move forward as a community within that framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doctor Doctor yeah, Castro, I, I wanted to I wanted to say first say thank you to you for how you've how you've led us through these months. Um, and specifically for like, as we think about the equity and inclusion and compassion and leadership group for faculty and staff, right? One of our, one of our, the, the focus we have there is about the student experience, but to be able to support the student experience, we need to be able to process together as adults. Um, and whether we're talking about the election or we're talking about George Floyd, or we're talking about Black Lives Matter or protests in Seattle, or like the, the you know, the person who asked this question, like the current climate, the opportunity for, you know, like good parents, right, to come together and process and make some meaning together um, before we go to work and interact with students has been invaluable, um, especially over the last the last few months. And so um, I appreciate, Ed, the way you invite us into that space and give people room to process together um, before, you know, we walk out to do our classes. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say that um, yeah, just echoing Matt's thanks um, for your leadership, Ed, and, and the EICL group. And I think, you know, one one theme here, I guess, that that <laughs> that I'm hearing tonight is that um, I think faculty and um, and adults in this community think about their work. Um, in the community as very much connected to the outside world and also um, that we are in conversation and, and growing and working and developing together. So, um, you know, and, and I'm not on, you know, I'm not privy to administrative policy decisions, at least most of the time. Um, so I can't speak to that. Um, and I, you know, I think responding to the current political climate has been much more a matter of um, reaching out to students and faculty and offering support and having conversations and developing our knowledge and awareness, um, you know, in in, um, in terms of, as Matt said, everything from something that might be happening in Seattle, you know, on that day to, um, you know, to the national political arena. Um, and so it's it's really not, and, and I think too, like the administration and, and the faculty are pretty connected at this school. And so, um, you know, I think as someone who's been here a long time, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm not at a place where the administration will make policy changes or sort of come top down with, um, you know, with uh, some kind of agenda. Um, but instead, you know, as a faculty member who's part of the EICL group, um, and just simply part of the faculty, I'm going to be involved in in conversations. Um, 
And um, as as a couple, I think Ed and Jamie both mentioned, I'm um, we're working on and investigating affinity groups for um, for students and for adults in the community. Um, those are already happening in a lot of places, student clubs and, and informally. Um, and that's something that's very dynamic and responsive to um, to the current climate as well as as well as just you know connected to to good student um, identity development. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, that, I think that that's helps. that's kind of yeah more than policy changes. It's mm -hmm. things are always we're always developing. I think. Yeah, I I appreciate you you know um, emphasizing that Elena because I think that uh, when I think about Allies for Equity as a student group. Um, you know, they very much felt empowered to initiate conversations with not only fellow students within the community, but adult members of the community. So as to say, you know, we really want to we want to have thoughtful conversation as a school um, around, you know, what what does um, what does the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, mean for us as a school community? What is that? What does you know the example, unfortunately, of you know George Floyd or Breonna Taylor? mean um you know in this moment and how are we going to grapple with that and i think it's that invitation to conversation and and being in dialogue with one another um you know that is that is helping us as a school community to really develop more empathy and understanding for you know where other people's viewpoints are um and hopefully that's going to translate to that you know that that larger level or that next step or that family conversation whatever is going to happen for that student um so i really appreciate that in, I wanna, in many um, ways, i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah, to cut you off uh, but in many ways that th those conversations which are happening in, in several clubs are also you know in keeping with the mission i mean they seem uncomfortable and especially for students and, and which is part of like the 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 presentation that that uh, miss belfiore gave uh last week about the work that she does right it's having uncomfortable conversations and practicing having uncomfortable conversations and really grappling and and reckoning with what you what you're feeling and what you understand, and so you know the thinking and the acting and the leading. I mean that like all of those things are really in keeping with our mission, and that in the conversations, but the process itself mm -hmm. is what is really really empowering, really powerful for our students to go through. Mm -hmm. And I mean not just the students. I mean it's powerful and, and important and uh, important for me to go through that as well. Oh, I'm hey, wondering hi. if hi. I'm wondering if uh, students like would have maybe a comment on this specifically because we did. This is a, just a sub question that I'm going to tack on to this one, um, where Yvonne wants to know: Have have you ever had a situation where a student expressed a point of view that was not a popular one? Let's say so. You know, I think Yvonne was talking about like in you know uh, they have, they have friends who have conservative viewpoints, and their son doesn't always feel comfortable expressing. Um, some of his viewpoints because he feels like he's maybe attacked, um, you know, and she's saying this isn't at EPS, but how would you handle a situation like that at EPS? And I'm wondering, like Harrison, does an example come to mind of a contentious conversation or, you know, something where, you know, really those viewpoints um, were able to go back and forth with one another um, in the classroom setting and what your experience of that has been as an well, EPS student? I think thankfully this hasn't happened to me in any serious sense. There's always disagreements between friends and there are quite frequently harsh words exchanged, but it's usually a somewhat of a joking tone. Actually, the thing that make, this makes me think of is uh, relating to my sister. She's in the seventh grade at Open Window and they've had a lot of issues with private chats and exclusion and stuff like that. And as far as I can tell their response is to include the parents in their discussion. And I think that's a really good idea. However, I think that we're in high school. I think that to an extent we can solve our own problems a little bit better. So I do appreciate that the school actually does give the students a voice in solving these issues. The disagreements I've been in a, a part of, I've generally been the peacemaker. I like to think of myself as that. Mm -hmm. um, but they usually are able to get resolved and in the rare chances that they aren't we can usually go to either an advisor or a close teacher or one of the counselors so i think that the school actually does a really good job of first letting us solve it because we will we will i'm sure that i will face many a problem in my adult life and if i don't know how to solve them myself i will struggle so i really do appreciate that the school lets us try to figure it ourselves out try to figure it out out ourselves and then provide us with good resources if we mm -hmm. can't.
on that, would you add anything from the middle school perspective to that? Um, you know, just conversations that you had where maybe there was somebody whose uh, who's opinion was, um, you know, not going to be part of the norm, but they, you know, th they had ways of supporting that opinion and they had something that they wanted to say. Um, I can't really think of an example, um, but in our history class, I think it was last week during the election, uh, Ms. Hale, who was amazing, um, she said, okay, go into these small groups and if, you're, if one of your classmates is feeling stressed or um, about the election or has a concern, um, listen to them and try and be supportive of them, um, you know, because teachers try to make environments where we can share ideas um, while still feeling comfortable hearing them. And, um, you know, my, one of my classmates, she was really stressed about it and she just started talking and rambling on and on. Um, but um, we were able to sort of support her and, um, you know, let her know that, you know, if you needed any like resources, we were there for her. Um, and another thing that's not exactly related to the question, but um, I know the middle school has a civic, civic engagement club. Um, where students can get involved in um, our local government. I know we have a, we've had a couple of representatives um, come in to the club to just talk to us. And um, in history right now, we're also learning about Washington um, history and we're reaching out to our representatives to get involved in our community. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up civic engagement because I think a big a big part of that club is really having, um, you know, it's it's really about being engaged in those civic dialogues that are essentially, you know, about having opposing viewpoints from time to time or having, you know, differing perspectives. And I think having a forum in which that is modeled and it's, um, you know, there is support there with the faculty moderator. And just like you were saying, Harrison, you you know who those resources are that you could go to if things escalated to a point where when somebody had something that was kind of out of the norm or contentious, like you would know kind of who you could go to there. I think that's very much in the spirit of um, civic engagement, wanting to grapple with these things and wanting to do it in a way that it's not safe per se because you know safety is not the goal there the goal is you know dialogue and and coming to places of common understanding um so you know i, I i'm glad you brought that up on i i would just also echo i mean one of the things that i um, appreciate about east side prep is the diversity of opinions that are represented um, in classrooms and the and the idea i mean we not only do we tolerate differences of opinions but we actually encourage it i mean i would love i I'd love to hear students having respectful conversations about uh differing opinions whether it's politics or some other topic um and in fact i think our faculty do a really nice job of guiding those discussions and uh, providing some some ground rules around them the one thing we don't tolerate here ever is the the personal attacks that can sometimes grow you know i mean i sort of reading between the lines uh, in the question that was asked there you know that sort of um you know you have a difference of opinion than i do therefore i'm going to put you down as a person or question your integrity or question your intelligence that sort of argument doesn't stand at east side prep and we're pretty quick to to jump into those uh and make corrections where needed but when when uh debate or a dialogue is happening respectfully and based on on uh, some shared understanding. Uh, I mean, that that's an enriching experience for our students and for the whole community. Absolutely. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to pivot us to a couple of questions that came into the chat, um, really speaking to how we support equity and inclusion as it relates to neurodiversity, um, learning differences, and you know this is a big part of who we are and 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 how we were founded. You know, sort of the principles that we were founded upon. Um, so, Jamie, I'm wondering if you could, from the learning support perspective, start us off with that question, and then um, others can contribute some ideas that they have. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is looking at the language that we use to describe learning. And so as a faculty this year, we've really been talking about learner variability and that learner variability is what's expected. We don't expect that 95% of our students will learn one way and there might be a 5% outlier. We expect that students will differ in their abilities across disciplines and that they'll differ in their um, abilities internally with different skills um, and that 
one of the most important things is to help students understand their own learning profile. So we have been doing some work with that um, with 8th, 9th and 10th graders this year and helping them do some self reflection about how they learn best and also really bringing that awareness that all of us have strengths and challenges when it comes to learning um, so that students who are part of our learning support community don't feel stigmatized for reaching out for that type of support. The other thing that we've been doing this year that I've really enjoyed is I've been going into middle school advisories to offer some suggestions that you know are sort of beneficial for the entire community. And the way that I've been framing my role for them is that as learning support coordinator, my job is to identify barriers to learning and to help students break those down. And so that could be a diagnosed learning disability, but that could also be something like I've never had to use Teams before or Canvas is a confusing platform for me and I need some help. And so making it clear that any one of those challenges is something that you can come to learning support for and right. having you know that sort of the actual learning uh, diagnosed learning disability or medical um, challenge that might impact learning that that those are just sort of a piece of the puzzle and only one reason that um, that students will seek that out. Um, so that it's been really fun to see the students who are reaching out to me to ask questions. Um, I've been getting to interact with many more students than um, than I normally do. So that's been um, a really wonderful experience this year. That's great. And Jamie, can you talk about um, the way that, uh, you know, for example, and maybe this is something that extends over to to Matt and 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 others. Um, when we think about uh, learner variability and differentiation within curriculum, like how do you see that reflected in terms of, let's say, a math class at EPS or a history class at EPS in terms of, you know, how does that practically work on the ground, um, what you're mentioning here? Because it sounds like you're doing a great job of supporting um, the educators that are, are facilitating that type of differentiation. Absolutely. The one of the things that we've been talking about a lot this year is equity and access, and that is even more important during a remote environment, but really making sure that students have access to materials in a format that works for them. So a lot of student or a lot of teachers are doing um, recorded instructions so that students can refer back to those instructions and also read the instructions at the same time. Um, we've been doing some work with assistive technology um, so that students who have accommodations for audio or for text to speech um, or speech to text are able to use those well in this format. And then, you know, the other thing that's more informal is that um, teachers reach out to me pretty frequently just to say, you know, could you look over this this assignment for me? Do you see anything in here that could be problematic for any group of learners who might look at this? And so we'll go through the language. We'll talk about the steps. Is it appropriately scaffolded for the grade level? Um, so looking at, you know, is it developmentally appropriate as well? So there's just so much collaboration and teachers are so aware um, that that's something that they want to be focused on. So that's a big piece of it too, aside from just the, the sort of formal pieces that we have in place. That's super I think that, uh, Jamie, as you're talking, like the as you were talking before, you said the word access. That's what was was flashing for me um, as you were describing your role and, and how you're working with folks. Um, and we're thinking about it from the moment of like, you know, application, right? Like students, how can they access the program? How can they be successful in the program? And then as we have this experience with students in particular classes, it's how can they access what we're explaining, right? The curriculum or the curricula that we're designing. And I, I have to say, you know, reflecting on the faculty work over the, the course of, you know, the last seven, eight months, um, thinking about how much better educators we are in terms of access because we've been designing for remote, right? What are the what are the five different ways I need to explain something, right? Or what are the four different resources I needed to put out there so each of the students in the class has access to information that lets them take it in in the way that they learn best, right? And then from there, 
figuring out where I can provide support, whether that's in the moment, in, in, in a remote session, in a smaller channel group, doing a meeting with a student right before class starts, sticking around after class to talk through um, what we worked on, right? That's, for me, that's always been the case. Elena, since we've started, right? Like assessment doesn't end when, when the period is over, right? It's still happening as we're walking down the hall. Um, constantly working to understand where a student is um, and, and trying to ask the right questions to get them to where they need to be. I think it's something that faculty actually genuinely really love about um, working at Eastside Prep is that we have an amazing, first of all, an amazing learning support um, office um, and that you know, we have a we have a diversity of, of learners in our classroom. Um, I know for me, um, that was something that drew me to the school actually in the from the very beginning. Um, even though I was coming, I was coming from a college teaching environment um, and really had no experience um, <laughs> working with um, either high school students or um, having support in working with a diversity of learners. Um, I think university environments are much more, uh, they're, they're changing, thankfully, but certainly um, in those days it was sort of one size fits all. And so I was really excited to be at a place um, that had such st a strong ethic of um, the opposite philosophy that, um, you know, learning happens differently for each student and that actually makes teaching more fun. Well, speaking of what makes teaching more fun and maybe learning more fun, I'm wondering if just to close this out this evening, if folks would share um, just a quick, a quick, you know, moment, word, phrase around um, something that feels like a, a, a fun and engaging thing. Maybe it's something that's happened quite recently, um, kind of within the EPS community for you, like Anhat, you just mentioned um, as you were introducing yourself, participating in The Hobbit, which we did as a radio play with our middle schoolers um, for the middle school play this fall, um, but just something that feels like a, a place of connection. Because when I think we're, you know, focusing on well-being, we're talking about that belonging, we're talking about that connection. And Paul, as you said, that is rooted in relationship for us. Um, so I'm wondering if you can just share a connection moment, a fun moment, something that feels um, connected. Maybe it's that laughter type of moment that Paul was mentioning, um, but just something that brings a smile to your face from the past week or so at EPS. Well, for me, I like I said, I did the EPS in-person event. That was a really cool thing. It was a great opportunity to get to see my friends and to talk, catch up with them. Um, we have, I've done a lot of team meetings with my friends and we have our group chats, but there's really no substitute for real human interaction. So doing that was really nice. And yeah, I mean, the teachers, while it's somewhat awkward because they make a joke and then you have to reach over and hit your unmute button so you can laugh. And by the time that's happening, it's like five seconds past me, like thinking, hey, should I laugh? Wait, maybe he's moving on to teaching again. Should I laugh? It was really funny. Okay, it's not that funny anymore. It, it's somewhat awkward, but the teachers, they really do their best, I think, especially Dr. Castro, who has class at 7.30 in the morning with 30 kids who want to be in bed. Uh, the teachers do a really great job making it entertaining and funny. Mm, Dr. Castro, then it's to you. Uh, <laughs> what do you have any from 7:30 zero period class recently, or, or another example? <laughs> wow, uh, there are so many stories. Um, trying to think of my my favorite one, you know, and sometimes this is um. Here's a thing that that became a, a, a thing in uh, our class. Speaking of the 730 class uh, in creating a worksheet for for students, and I often change them because uh, we cover the same material we invented. Well, we didn't my mistake, but then students caught on to it and then the, we've invented a new uh, a new word that is part of an interval. Now this interval is usually that's usually a third, but for some reason I wrote it as thirth, right? 
three with a TH, which doesn't exist. But, you know, now every every time they hear a major third, it's a major thirth. So, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the kind of silliness we, we encounter at 730 in the morning when you when you can't really play your instruments together. Right. So mm -hmm. we invent words and invent new intervals. <laughs> and isn't the thirth if you play it the higher note first, that's the ding dong sound? <laughs> So next time y'all get a package at your door, you can think of the third compliment <laughs> and Harrison. <laughs> what other fun memories come to mind or just moments of connection recently? I'll just share that, you know, as part of my role, I spend a lot of time meeting one on one with students and checking in about assignments and how classes are going. And so I was meeting with a student and we had kind of run through all of her schoolwork and I asked her if there was anything else that she wanted to um, chat about or go over and she said yeah how's your knitting project going um, and so that was really fun just to have that moment of first of all she remembered that I was working on a knitting project and um, also that you know one of the things I, I love so much about our students is that I really feel like oftentimes they're supporting us as much as we're supporting them and that, you know, we show them so much that we respect them as individuals and care about them as individuals. And I feel like that goes both ways. So that was just a really fun moment. And I was I was really um, I was really touched by her caring in that moment. Yeah, that's so great. How is your knitting project going, by the way? <laughs> Very slowly because I'm running out of the color of yarn that I need and I need to buy more. All right. Well, but thank you for asking. Good luck with that. And and Mr. Delaney, I hear you laughing in the background. What's uh What's something that you would share? Um, I you talk about you know how uh, Ms. Andrews how we are supported by students or or how we learn from them. Um, a student came to Dr. Stegman a couple of weeks ago with a suggestion for how our small channel groups could go better in teams, like as we were having remote classes. Um, and so he invited that student into the upper school faculty meeting a couple of days later to watch that student um, on screen so poised talking to you know 55 um, adult educators and, and saying like I think it could go a little bit better if we did something like this right um, listening to that and then you know going back to playing my classes and saying I actually think it will go a little bit better if we do it like that. Um, so that moment in time, like that student improving, like being courageous enough, brave enough to speak up, right? To want to improve things to back to a previous thing. Um, and then for folks be, being there and open to hearing and taking taking that information and then and working to improve things. That, that was huge for me. Yeah, really hearing that student voice, not just couching it as, oh, this is a great little idea that a student has. How cute. But no, no, it was a... something that could help our pedagogy. Yeah. This could help us improve. This could, you know, help us in remote um, and, you know, potentially beyond. So it's really powerful. Yeah. And um, another teacher I... and I implemented that student's idea, one of one of their main ideas um, that same day and yes. did it again yesterday. So that was that was really cool. Yeah. Anything else you would add, Elena? Um, I just actually I did just re realize I, I had an amazing, lovely moment of connection today. Um, I was in a meeting with um, a couple of students and another faculty member actually um, with um, the student leader of the Girls Empowerment Club um, who I work with and then one of the student leaders of the Pride Alliance um, and we were in a planning meeting um, to plan a, a conversation that we're going to be hosting for the upper school in a few weeks. And uh, and I also advise um, both of those students. They're both seniors, 12th graders, and I advise both of them in, in the college counseling capacity. And so one of them at the end of the meeting said, oh, Dr. Olson, do you have a couple minutes? I just have a, a question. And I said, sure. And I just assumed it was a it was a college related question because they're in the thick of college applications. Um, and but but it wasn't um, they wanted to talk to me about literature, poetry, any re recommendations I had for um, for books that I have read recently. Um, they're doing an independent study next trimester and um, just wanted um, to talk with me about that. And I thought we would chat for a few minutes. We ended up talking for almost 20 minutes just about books and it was so fun. 
Um, it was a moment in my day where I just got to talk about books in a, in a non, you know, classroom spe specific perspective and um, great. I love that. I love that. Well, um, you know, you all have just spent an hour and a half talking about topics that are very close to our hearts and near and dear to what we um, consider to be super important as a school community, um, having that well-being for members of our community, having that sense of belonging. So I want to say thank you for um, taking that time and making that time. And uh, and I want to highlight the upcoming panels that we will have. You can also, if you follow the URL at the bottom of the screen, that's where you can get to the recordings of the existing panels that we've already done. Um, so please go ahead and um, take a look at that. Uh, you'll find all of the, the panel information on the website. You'll also find information about the um, financial aid workshop that Mr. Otley, Casey Otley, and myself will be hosting on the 18th of November. Um, so we hope to see you very soon for that opportunity if, um, if that is one that appeals to you. And uh, I just want to say a special thanks to the students and faculty and staff who are here this evening. Um, hearing their voices speak directly to the topics that you all are thinking about is always powerful for me. I always learn something from them. I hope that you've taken um, some core components of our community away from this um, just through the, the little things and the examples that they've shared. And um, I just want to say thank you again to um, Anhat and Harrison in particular, um, who were great student panelists and made time for us during their busy schedule. So let's give some snaps and claps to Anhat and Harrison. Thank you both. Um, and, you know, just really grateful for the, the partnership that we have with our student investors, um, with our faculty in helping you through this virtual admissions process. We're, we're grateful that we get to show you who we are and we hope that you're really hearing um, some things that are important to us as you evaluate what's important to you as a family and thinking about your next school home. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks so much for being here and we'll look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys. This was a lot of fun actually. I really thought I was able to do it. Yeah, we enjoyed it. <laughs>